Thank you for coming along today, or for having me particularly. Um, my name's Chris Wilson, and I am the Senior Learning and Teaching Advisor in LEI, but I'm also uh, based in ADT uh, in electronics and sound as a musician. And over the last few years particularly, I've been very interested in this idea of what creativity is, and have noticed it become a far more significant uh, element of higher education agenda setting, uh, particularly over the last two years. I'm sure you will have seen references to the word, particularly in this faculty, but also to things like entrepreneurship and innovation uh, as more significant, um, well, areas of thought, I suppose, in terms of curriculum design. So I'm, I'm just going to try and rethink what that might mean, uh, what that might mean, and talk you through some of the research I've done over the last couple of years uh, into what that means possibly for you as learners and for us as academics uh, and for us more broadly as a, a higher education institution, um, in a nutshell. So effectively, um, if any of you have had the chance to read any of the articles that I managed to uh, pass over to uh, the share space, particularly for this uh, lecture series, there were a series of articles by a colleague, James Kaufman, uh, who's based in California, who talks about uh, little c, creativity, which is what everybody does all the time, every day. Um, just talking without a script involves little c. Uh, we decide what we're going to say and we innovate combinations of words in real time. Some of which may have been the first time anybody has uttered that particular combination of words. Uh, but more importantly, we want to work out what the connection is between little c, the stuff we do every day, uh, we make things up, we innovate on the spot, talking, thinking, interacting, uh, moving and playing, to big C, which is stuff that we actually can't define, uh, that we can't predict, um, that we may be able to see the early stages of in certain circumstances, but this is the, the proverbial moon landings, this is the um, development of groundbreaking scientific endeavour or major scientific breakthroughs, the stuff that's way beyond what we can perhaps calibrate at this particular level. But they are connected, and we know that small uh, creativity leads to medium-sized creativity, builds towards large creativity. Uh, and there are also some fundamental questions about the arts. Um, Edward de Bono, uh, a short talking head snippet coming up in a moment, suggests very glibly in one of his uh, major texts um, that the arts tend to talk about creativity a lot, but in most cases there is no creativity in the arts. So we need to think about what we mean in that context as well. When are we creating, when are we recreating other people's ideas? So we're going to try and do um, a few things today. Drift through some basic outline ideas of creativity, who thinks what, how we can conceive of perhaps a more graduated series of levels of creativity. Um, think a little bit about creativity in education, which is more going through one or two uh, research papers and conference presentations I've done over the last couple of years. I'm not sure whether or not we're going to have a think break, which is a chance for you to escape, um, primarily because I've pitched towards a longer session than we are actually going to do today, which is my fault. Um, an overview of creative thinking techniques. What can you do uh, to improve your personal creativity, um, and then we'll try and tie those things together. But there'll be an opportunity, I hope, at the end uh, for general thoughts and ideas um, in terms of what you've taken from today and what your thoughts are about this topic fundamentally. Um, but before we do get started, um, a reference to Steve Jobs, somebody who is widely considered to be at the big C end of the creativity spectrum. There's somebody who's redefined um, or through whose actions we have redefined um, part of the employment sector that you may be moving into. It's partly a, a, a responsibility of Steve Jobs that um, the nature of the industry around you is going to offer different opportunities and not as many opportunities as would have been there 10 or 20 years ago. But as the quote uh, sort of encapsulates, it's talking about trying to move outside what is already known, uh, stretch what is known in one direction, or to transcend patterns of experience, thought, and ideas that we've had before up to a certain point. Now, I've got a couple of very brief uh, scene-setting YouTube videos. I'll apologize in advance um, for one of those two, which does have a reference to defecation in it, but there is a reason for that. So I'm asking you to open your minds real wide, if that's possible, and 
uh, if you have a very sensitive nature, perhaps to uh, look away at the requisite point. Um, but before we do all of that, uh, we're going to do a test. Uh, we're going to test your creativity at the start of the session to see how creative you are on a Monday afternoon. We're going to use the Torrance test, or one of the Torrance tests for creativity. You've got a piece of paper in front of you with blank circles. The task, very simply, in 30 seconds, uh, is to animate or to doodle uh, on those circles. Start with a smiley face. It's the most obvious thing you can do to a circle, to turn it from a circle into something else. And I want you to come up with as many different ideas as you can in 30 seconds. The goal is quantity of ideas not quality. Go. I should have some incidental music, but I don't. <laughs> so you can just imagine that. I should be measuring 30 seconds as well. I'm not doing that either. That's a very generous 30 seconds, so we'll come to a halt at that point, please. Right, um, if I can collect your sheets in, we shall go through some of your ideas. Don't need to put your names on them. Throw them in my direction. Okay, let's have a look. Variations, yes. that's what we like to see. Very good. Oh, people working in different ways. Thank you. People withholding, that's fine. Thank you. People are still scribbling, but that's okay. You take as much opportunity as you can. Over my direction. Don't need to, don't need names on there, that's fine. Unless you're suitably proud of your contribution, in which case, absolutely fine. Any more at the back there? Thank you. Fill them through. Thank you very much. Right, and I shall do a meta-analysis of these very, very quickly. Okay. Let's first have a look. Um, so everybody's taken the invitation to start with a face, which is very good. That's three, that's four, uh, three, four, five, six of those. Oh, very good. We've got a planet Earth. Somebody's turned one into a bee. That's quite useful. Snowman's face. First thing that stands out, first example I've come to where somebody's decided not to just do a design within one circle, but has incorporated the circle below to be the uh, second part of a snowman, which is rather good, or snow person, I should say. Most people don't do that, which is quite interesting. Let's have a look. We've got a couple of dots, several faces. Ah, somebody there has um, turned uh, the side of one circle into a sort of a lunar eclipse or a moon by chopping off the side of it, which is quite interesting, not seeing many of those. We've got a cat and a dog, a football, uh, somebody else has added a bracket to the side, so we've got a tennis racket, which is another really good one, but not many people have done those. An eyeball, very good, first eyeball. A polo mint, I like that one. That's an unusual one. Another, oh, that's a very good planet Earth. I, I should have the visualizer on, but I don't. Um, that's a very accurate planet Earth, very good. Another four, don't know what that is, just a flower in the middle, or a stick man in the middle of the circle saying hi, and um, that's quite good. Don't know whether it incorporates the circle, but there we are. Similar thing, we've got another planet, we've got Saturn there, it looks like. Somebody there's turned theirs into a coin, a clock face. Tennis ball, very interesting. Now, um, I will go through these in a bit more detail. What was the point of that? Um, well, one of the challenges we have in terms of trying to evaluate creativity is how do we measure it? And the obvious thing that you can measure in terms of creativity is fluency, the quantity of ideas. So here's the first conclusion from today's session. Fluency and quantity of ideas always aligns positively with quality of ideas. So if you want to have more creative ideas, the first thing you can try and do is produce more ideas. Uh, and that works every single time. Um, there are various examples. One I'll give you. We have a songwriting module uh, in our uh, popular music degree here. Uh, and at the last validation, we were taken to task on whether or not it was appropriate to ask our first years to write six whole songs in a 20-credit module. 
Um, we managed to win the argument, and then we turned to each other at the end of the session and said, thank goodness we didn't tell them that we wanted the students to submit the last six songs that they've written and not the first 94, uh, because they might have seen that as being a bit too much of a problem. But we know this happens all the time. Students arrive, and we say, you're going to perform an original song by next week, and they'll say, ah, very busy week. I don't know if I've got enough time to get one ready by next week. A week, and you can't write one song, uh, well, you better get one done for tomorrow then. But I haven't got time to do one by tomorrow. Well, come back in two hours and do it then. But I, I can't possibly, you've got an hour. And if you keep going, this is going to be start singing an original song immediately. And the strange thing is, for those students that hold out to that nth degree, right, you're going to have to do it now and on the spot, they find that they can. It may not be great, it may not be perfect as they see it, the problem being, in terms of fluency in that context, is that they try to produce the perfect thing. And if you have your quality control switched on, you will stop yourself exploring a number of ideas that may not be right initially, but may be one step away from a perfect solution. Another reference to songwriting. Paul McCartney's written some of the greatest songs of the 20th century. The first six songs he wrote were terrible. The last six songs he wrote weren't great either, leaving that to one side, but the best songs he wrote were after writing thousands of songs. So if you want to produce better material, write more, um, and I'll explore those at length. But just flicking through these very briefly, I think the maximum that anybody has got to is about seven or eight. Now in 30 seconds, that's a few seconds each, uh, but immediately the conclusion would be, most of you were thinking too much. You were trying to produce an idea and then come up with another good idea, then another good idea. Just any ideas will do. So, fluency matters. Um, if you want and have um, a suitable uh, iPhone, for example, you can download free the uh, Riesman Diagnostic Creativity Assessment, which is based on Torrance's work at the Torrance Centre at Drexel University. Download it for free. Go through a series of questions. You will get direct feedback about how creative you are, according to the Torrance tests. Uh, and there are a range of other options as well. So, fluency matters. Um, what was that supposed to be? I think that was supposed to be a video. Oh, it is a video. What is creativity?
it's free thinking, and, and, and part of the reason I showed you that was to stress the point that actually uh, openness to experience, a high tolerance threshold for the unconventional and the unusual do align themselves positively with more creativity because you're filtering out less, you're switching off less. And this idea that um, actually what we're talking about is unconvention but recognising that all creativity is derivative. It has to be attached to something in order to be recognisably creative in its own context. Again, a reference to songwriting. Part of what our, particularly our first year students, often seek to try and achieve and think they're struggling to uh, succeed with is originality. And we point out that's the last thing that they should want to aim for because it's too easy. Um, and I'll reproduce a little exercise that I do or did with them in songwriting. I shall now compose for you the world's most original popular song. Um, here we are. There we go. What do you think? I've broken nearly every convention associated with popular song. I haven't used time-based art forms anymore. That's old hat. So I've used three-dimensional object instead of time. Um, I've decided not to use space, but instead you've used red and cushions. Uh, it doesn't work. So that is, on one level, the most original popular song ever composed, and it's completely rubbish. It's not creative. Um, it's not connected enough with the domain that I'm trying to innovate within for it to be recognisably creative. But it's very original, but it's useless. So in order to be original in songwriting, we have to use some things that have been used before. We have to use sound, music, images, and everything else. Um, so several questions come out of that to start with. Is creativity always good? Another thing that uh, James Kaufman talks about, particularly his article about taking Superman out for a date, is that sometimes being creative is the very last thing that you want. Um, as you're about to come into land on an international airplane, you do not want your pilot thinking, do you know, I'm sick of landing this way. Why don't we see what happens if we do that? No. That's not the time for creativity. On the other hand, if that same plane is coming into land and one of the engines goes, then you want a very creative pilot. You want somebody who's going to be able to find a connection, a way out of that situation that they may not have practiced before. Um, we know also that uh, in the context of education, lots of surveys, particularly in primary and secondary education, not just in Europe, but in the US as well, most teachers say the same thing about creativity, all for it, brilliant. That's just what we want our kids to be. But then the evidence of what happens when creativity emerges in the classroom, it's disruptive, it's difficult to manage, it goes against the grain and teachers don't like it. The last thing you want in the middle of a prescribed maths lesson at key stage one is for a student to say, I've drawn this picture of a football. No matter how innovative it might be, it's not the time or place for that. Put that away, you can do that later in the art class, etc., etc. Um, and perhaps the most pernicious rumor that is not true um, is that creativity can't be developed, you either have it or you don't, um, it can't be taught, it can't be fostered, it can't be developed, or at best what you need to do is cross your fingers and see if it pops out at a certain point that might be useful. Um, none of those things are true. It can be developed and you can do so through strict action. Um, Edward de Bono I mentioned, just a brief um, two minutes from Edward. If we uh, look at the human brain as a computer, we then have to ask what is the software we use with that computer? Well, in general, the software, at least of Western civilization, was originally designed 2,400 years ago by the Greek gang of three, the GG3, who were, of course, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. We've done virtually nothing about thinking since then. Creative thinking is a skill. It's not just a matter of individual talent. It's not just a matter of sitting by the river and playing baroque music and hoping you get inspired. That's very weak stuff. 2,000 years ago, China was way ahead of the West in science and technology. They had rockets and gunpowder and such things. What happened? What happened was scholars in China started to believe that you could move from certainty to certainty, and as a result, they never developed the possibility system, never developed hypothesis, speculation, imagination. Progress came to a dead end. One of the very important things about creativity is that the new idea, the creative idea, must have value. 
Far too many people who believe they are creative think that just being different for the sake of being different is creative. It is not, and that is what gets creativity a bad name. So if you look at a door and you say doors are normally rectangular, let's make a triangular door. Now, unless you can show value for that, that is not creativity. That is just being different for the sake of being different. Now, one of the reasons people are reluctant to be creative in general is that if you try out an idea and it doesn't work, that is regarded as a mistake. Now, a big def deficiency in language, certainly in the English language, is we don't have a word which says fully justified venture, which for reasons beyond your control did not succeed. So anything which did not succeed is called a mistake, and people don't like mistakes, because that stands in the way of their promotion and their career. Provocation is uh, one of the methods of lateral thinking, one of the tools of lateral thinking. It is completely contrary to the opposite of our normal logical thinking. In our normal logical thinking, you can only say things which make sense, which fit our experience and fit in with what we've said before. With a provocation, there may not be a reason for saying something until after you have said it. But because it puts us down in a different position in the patterning system, it allows us to open up new ideas. Thinking outside the box means thinking for unusual ideas being creative. The notion is that we are all within a certain box which is formed by the constraints, by our expectations, by the concepts we use, by the perceptions we use, and we play around in that box. So thinking outside the box means escaping from, breaking out of the box to change concepts, change perceptions, change constraints, change rules, and develop new ideas. It really it means developing an idea which would not have been expected in our usual behavior, in our usual thinking. So it's just another term for creative thinking, unusual thinking, or lateral thinking. I prefer the term lateral thinking because that is very specifically defined in system terms, which means moving across from the main pattern to a side pattern, which once you're there, in hindsight, you can link up with your starting point. But thinking outside the box is a general term, meaning unusual ideas, ideas which would not have arisen within the box of your usual thinking. One particular example thinking about um, creativity and innovation, and it does happen spontaneously, it can happen uh, when you're least expecting it. A little anecdote about my uh, elder daughter playing in the garden in the summer, and um, she's got a little plastic cricket set and I'm bowling the ball to her and she's trying to hit the ball and she managed to hit the ball quite well. She's got a good arm ball as well, very proud father I am. Uh, but then she missed the ball once with the bat and she kicked the ball and before the ball had even landed she shouted, fuck it. And I said, excuse, she's seven, and I said, I beg your pardon. She went, fuck it, because it's a cross between football and cricket. <laughs> now, this was an innocent connection to her. She'd never heard the word in a profane context before, but she invented a sport no adult who speaks quite a broad language would ever have constructed. Nobody would have thought, I know, let's combine these sports, because somebody would say, yeah, but imagine what that could be called. It wouldn't sound right. But that happened in her brain the instant that she kicked that ball. She wasn't planning to kick it, but her brain found that connection. There's two things. I've played football before, I've played cricket before. What happens if we conflate those terms, we come up with something new? Um, so look out for the thriving new British sport of fuck it in years to come. Um, levels of creativity. Um, there is some thought that actually in higher education we should be focused on invention and innovation, levels three and four. Um, sorry, academic and technical and inventive level, but we are perhaps in, unable in higher education to work towards innovation or certainly towards genius level. We can't even define what genius level is or how that comes to be. Um, it just does. Certain people end up winning the Nobel Prize. We know that there's tens of years of effort and scientific research that leads up to that, but why do they have that kind of brain capable of that and this other person doesn't? Um, we don't know. Um, the other way of looking at it is with the three circles, and that's a, a reference to some research by Margaret Bowden, who talked about uh, H and P creativity. 
Uh, and in higher education, everybody should be trying to ex be innovative at their own level. Everything you do should be new to you. Uh, and the more you do that, you might work towards being innovative within your group, which might be your cohort, your module group, or it might be your subject area. And every now and again, somebody does something that becomes globally significant, is the first at a human scale or at a world level. The interesting thing about the Torrance test is that these have been done so widely and so internationally that there are some people pulling together examples of this internationally to see where innovation comes. And we see great cultural differences in terms of how people approach particular tasks. Um, we are patterned according to our um, cognitive self, our psychological makeup, but also our cultural influences as well. In terms of assessing creativity, which is the other problem we face at the other side, particularly in this faculty, we assess it all the time. I do it every year uh, in a musical context. What is the most creative piece of music submitted this year? It's that one, and it gets an A+, plus, or it gets a 100%. And translating something we can hear in sound back through a series of filters and into a number, we need to defend this stuff um, with external examiners. So we look at, well, ways of describing that to a certain extent. Uniqueness. Um, the combination or association of ideas within it, the potential it has for further development. So one of my favourite words in creativity research is germinality. The potential for an idea to stimulate even more new ideas. Uh, and we get that a lot with technology. Um, but we tend to talk about operability, well-craftedness, attractiveness. And, or in the end, we fall over and say, all right, fair enough. In the end, what we do is get enough experts together, and when we all agree that something's creative, then it must be. Um, but it still disappears in a smokescreen if we're not careful. Um, again, uh, reference to um, Kaufman's work. Um, not only is he talking about little c and big c, um, I gather from uh, uh, talking to him in Philadelphia a few weeks ago that they're now starting to look at micro c, as an even earlier point of creativity. Mini, little, pro, and big. So in the context there, for example, you've got uh, a child picking up the guitar and making, um, or coming to terms with it at one level. Then you get an amateur band that might be a little C. They're still innovating at their own level, coming up with some new ideas, sometimes by accident, sometimes by design. Um, my favorite definition of where innovation in pop music comes from, amateur band start try to reproduce the sound of this other band, get it wrong, produce something new. Um, that was the classic story of the Beatles. Uh, by the time the first of the Mersey Beat recordings from Liverpool went back to the US, the US thought this, thought this was a new innovative area of music. And all the bands trying to produce Mersey Beat were trying to sound like rock and roll bands, but they got it wrong a bit, or subtly. Um, all that to Big C that we know about, global impact, difficult to sort of pitch for or teach for, uh, but you get this sense of, I think, probably where you need to be aiming um, as undergraduates and eventually graduates. You need pro-C level creativity, and you need to know what that means and how to maintain it. So at the little C end of the spectrum, um, there's my same daughter's foot, but some years ago. Um, she was left alone, I think, for about two minutes painting. Um, and by the time we return, I've finished painting with the paper, I've painted my foot now, uh, and I'm painting my arms, and I've put some on my hair. Um, there's an example of a boundary breaking. Now, that wasn't what we decided, not because it was messy to do it that way around, but if you do art, what do you do? Uh, you find a piece of paper, you put some overalls on, you get the colours out, we know what the colours are, mix them up, a bit of water, and you paint onto that. Um, but the childish innocence of thinking, well, that's fine and everything else, but I've got these things dangling out the end of my legs. I'd really like to see what they felt like painting. And what did she say about that? Well, it feels better painting on your feet because you can feel where you're painting onto. Uh, and it's more interesting. And then I can put my foot onto the paper and the carpet and, and other things. So, but that's small c. That's not innovative. People have painted their bodies before. People will paint them again. It's an intuitive, in certain, to a certain extent, this is where human art emerged, was the decoration of ourselves and then our immediate surroundings and other things. Uh, that's a balloon sculpture. Um, 
at the Exhibition Centre in Oklahoma City in 2010. I went to the Creativity World Forum and there were a series of these huge balloon sculptures, each of which costing about $20,000 apparently, vast things. This is balloon animal making and somebody thought, what if I made this 30 feet tall? Um, so here's another example of how you can think creatively. Make it huge is a very simple creative thinking technique. We've got that, it works. What if we made it massive? Um, what if we made the scale of it ridiculously large? And my favourite one of these, which was a, a, a relatively smaller number, which is a bit like an igloo with huge fronds sticking out of it. And the chap who made it said, no, the idea is you can go in and you can lift it up and you can move about, carrying a huge balloon sculpture. Why? Why not? Uh, would be the simple answer. Uh, as Damien Hurst's For the Love of God, um, this is an example, I suppose, of where you might get uh, contention, particularly in the art field. Um, he's the first person that has decided to adorn um, a human skull with that amount of diamonds. Uh, it's one of the most expensive pieces of new art ever produced. Uh, and the title of it, though, is to confront this idea, um, I suppose, of how people might respond to it. Some people would suggest, as they would with his latest sculptural installation in Ilfracum, you might have seen uh, Verity going on display to varying degrees of public response, that that is not very creative at all, or it's marvellous, or it's incredible, or the other discussions about him and his art, yeah, but he didn't do it, he commissions it, other people put it together, but it's his idea. So is it doing it, is it thinking of it, is it realising it? Um, or perhaps in certain cases, some of the bravest examples of, of creativity, where somebody will have an idea that actually they know will be unfavourably received, will be resisted, and runs contrary to what everybody knows is true. But I've got an idea that suggests that everybody might be wrong. Um, and occasionally they come about, but that really big C stuff is relatively rare. Another example For the past of... five years, I've been investigating this question of where good ideas come from. It's a kind of problem I think all of us are intrinsically interested in. We want to be more creative. We want to come up with better ideas. We want our organizations to be more innovative. I've looked at this problem from an environmental perspective. What are the spaces that have historically led to unusual rates of creativity and innovation? And what I've found in all these systems there are these recurring patterns that you see again and again that are crucial to creating environments that are unusually innovative. One pattern I call the slow hunch, that breakthrough ideas almost never come in a moment of great insight and a sudden stroke of inspiration. Most important ideas take a long time to evolve, and they spend a long time dormant in the background. It isn't until the idea has had two or three years, sometimes 10 or 20 years, to mature that it suddenly becomes accessible to you and useful to you in a certain way. And this is partially because good ideas normally come from the collision between smaller hunches so that they form something bigger than themselves. So you see a lot in the history of innovation cases of, of someone who has half of an idea. There's a great story about the invention of the World Wide Web and Tim Berners-Lee. This is a project that Berners-Lee worked on for 10 years, but when he started, he didn't have a full vision for this new medium he was going to invent. He started working on one project as a side project to help him organize his own data. He scrapped that after a couple of years, and he started working on another thing. And only after about 10 years did the full vision of the World Wide Web come into being. That is, more often than not, how ideas happen. They need time to incubate, and they spend a lot of time in this partial hunch form. The other thing that's important when you think about ideas this way is that when ideas take form in this hunch state, they need to collide with other hunches. Oftentimes, the thing that turns a hunch into a real breakthrough is another hunch that's lurking in somebody else's mind. And you have to figure out a way to create systems that allow those hunches to come together and turn into something bigger than the sum of their parts. That's why, for instance, the coffee house in the age of the Enlightenment, or the Parisian salons of, of modernism, were such engines of creativity because they created a space where ideas could mingle and swap and create new forms. When you look at the problem of innovation from this perspective, it sheds a lot of important light on the debate we've been having recently about what the internet is doing to our brains. Are we getting overwhelmed with an always connected multitasking lifestyle? 
And is that going to lead to less sophisticated thoughts as we move away from the slower, deeper, contemplative state of reading, for instance? Obviously, I'm a big fan of reading. But I think it's important to remember that the great driver of scientific innovation and technological innovation has been the historic increase in connectivity and our ability to reach out and exchange ideas with other people and to borrow other people's hunches and combine them with our hunches and turn them into something new. That really has, I think, been, more than anything else, the primary engine of creativity and innovation over the last 600 or 700 years. And so yes, it's true we're more distracted. But what has happened that is really miraculous and marvelous over the last 15 years is that we have so many new ways to connect and so many new ways to reach out and find other people who have that missing piece that will complete the idea we're working on, or to stumble serendipitously across some amazing new piece of information that we can use to build and improve our own ideas. That's the real lesson of where good ideas come from, the chance favors the connected mind. It's also worth pointing out that part of the reason why um, particularly the role of the coffee house in the, in the Enlightenment era was so significant. And the simplest way I've always understood where did the Enlightenment come from? What did they give up before the arrival of coffee and caffeine? The only f uh, clean drinking source that they had was normally alcohol. So in, in the space of a very few years, people went from drinking beer for breakfast to having caffeine instead during the course of the day. You can kind of see how things could have turned a corner. Uh, but there we go. An ironic reference to Alzheimer's and dementia there as well. Um, so connectivity, connecting ideas, sharing ideas, mistakes are valuable as stepping stones towards particular success, fluency and quantity of ideas, the slow hunch, uh, this idea that actually producing the best and most creative um, results may take a long time. Um, and again, I'm going to br brush past the neurology of creativity today, but your right brain is working on stuff the whole time. Um, very brief um, reference to a John Cleese paper about creativity. He has a story where he lost a screenplay, uh, mislaid it, was very happy with it, couldn't find it, spent three days looking for it. In the end, uh, as the phrase goes, he bit the bullet, sat down, decided to rewrite it. As soon as he finished rewriting it, I know where I left it, and he found his original screenplay. But then he sat down and compared the two drafts. And which was the better? The rewrite was better. Why was the rewrite better? Because his right brain had carried on working on that screenplay even after he'd thought he'd finished typing up the first version. So when he came to sit down and rewrite it, lots of problems were ironed out, lots of little innovations were popped in, so he kept the rewrite. So when your academic colleagues say, Written work is about writing and redrafting and then rewriting and redrafting. They, they may be onto something. Um, we also know that we're in an educational context talking about being complicit within the same process. Um, sometimes we may not uh, aim in creative processes to produce X. We might end up with something else that's valuable. Uh, that's a problem for education systems. Uh, it's a problem on our music degrees because our final year students every few years suddenly dem demonstrate real aptitude in video production or photography or something else and we have to say sorry there's nothing we can do with that brilliant and everything well done um, but get on with the music please so we operate within structures uh, that can inhibit on occasions as well it's different to what we've done before um, so one of the simplest conclusions you can take about pr producing creativity is to get into the habit of doing new things uh, and one of the things we do with our first years, which is modelled on a, a New York State University model, is to get students to fill out a list of things they've done for the first time in a given week. Um, little risks that they've taken. Uh, it might be to ask a question in a tutorial. It might be to eat Thai food. It might be to cook a Sunday dinner with supervision and a fire extinguisher in, in the halls of residence, or whatever it might be. But the feedback we get from students is very clear. Unless we push them towards trying out new things, the tendency is to shrink back and to try and repeat your last success. Uh, and that's not just new university students, it's seven-year-olds in primary school as well. If you say to a group of um, kids in a primary school setting, right, we're all going to do art today, and we want really good creative ideas, all the students will have the same thought. What was the last really creative thing I did? I know, yes, it was a collage. Can I make a collage again? They'll try and repeat a success um, because we're that way motivated. 
try and make a mistake, might get you better results. Also, as I mentioned as well, I'm going to nip, by, uh, nip through a few of these points, some of which are a little less um, significant, but entrepreneurship and innovation, and I'm going to come back to trying to relate these three things a bit further down the line. Creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship, are they subsets of the same phenomena? Are we talking about the same thing? Or maybe we're talking about different things. Um, Richard Branson doesn't manufacture any trains. He doesn't manufacture any space rockets. Um, he doesn't make any technology. But he's a very successful entrepreneur that has invented nothing that he sells. But he outsources that. But that's not to suggest that Sir Richard Branson isn't a creative individual because thousands of people have tried to do what he does and have not succeeded in the same way. So maybe we're talking about creative entrepreneurship or innovative creativity or something. We'll see. Uh, I'm going to move on. Forgive me. OK. The other issue that I wanted to focus on was this idea of um, uh, terminology and the use of the word creative to describe various processes. Now, it's undeniably the case that being very explicit or more explicit in certain contexts can be useful. If any of you are going to make a decision to try and improve the level to which you are creative, you can't do so by having a good think, hoping your right brain's got hold of this task and will do it for you. Uh, you might need to be more proactive. At the same time, if we want you to be more creative, telling you that and shining a spotlight on you might be the wrong thing too. Um, those of you who were in earlier on may have seen us trying to test the radio mic. And it's amazing how very forthcoming, very fluid, very conversational and talkative individuals, as soon as you put a microphone on a stage and you say, pop up there and just test the microphone for me, what do they end up saying? One, two, three, one again. No, say anything you like. Uh, uh, hello, two, people become stultified when they're on the spot. So as soon as you put something or a context in front of somebody and saying we're looking for X, sometimes that can diminish the chance that that can emerge. So part of what I've been looking at over the last uh, couple of years is A, who talks about creativity, how do they talk about it, and to a certain extent, who doesn't. Uh, we know it's a major concern in educational policy, it's been talked about. You don't need to go far around the world before you find the world's most successful school systems who say very clearly, we want to change our world's most successful educational system to help produce more creative graduates, more creative students. So even in areas of success, people are thinking we've got further to go. We were going to have a break, but I'm going to finish in half an hour, so I'll just rattle on, if that's all right. Um, so in education, locating it, uh, a taxonomy of it, barriers to it, and uh, promoting it to a great extent. First thing um, is trying to think about uh, wh where this sits in terms of current research. Because again, there are lots of people, and I encounter them an awful lot in this university, colleagues, quite senior colleagues, who will roll their eyes at the C word, as they put it, and say, yeah, but it doesn't mean anything. You can't measure it. Um, it's... It's a nice term and everything else, but when it happens, it's brilliant. But beyond that, there's nothing we can do in terms of particular systems to produce it, and, and the opposite is true. Uh, we know, for example, that there is a, a, a series of strong reasons for trying to do more with creativity in higher education because it's been widely described as the number one graduate attribute for the 21st century, uh, the most important strategic priority in businesses and in industry, and, and so it goes. So when companies like IBM uh, undertake a, a massive audit um, of the changing dynamics of modern internationalized industry and say, yep, the top priority is to promote the development of that in our organizations, and the most important uh, leadership quality that we need to develop further is that, then we start to get a sense of what this means. And if you start to look at, say, the Fortune 500 or the world's uh, top 100 companies, those at the top, those doing well, are talking about this, have strategies in place, and are looking to employ graduates who are creative, know they are, and can explain how they are, that are comfortable to express it. They don't need people to do jobs that are already being done. They need people to come into organisations to do jobs that aren't yet being done, um, if that makes sense. 
Um, we know the creative industry sector matters as well. Uh, again, the creative industry sector terminology in the UK is very, very unhelpful, which is why I've paused here. It was useful initially, um, from my perspective in music, because we could wave a flag and say, no, 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 we do make money. There are jobs, honestly. Um, but it sort of implies that we have creative industries and we have uncreative industries. We do have uncreative industries, but they have gone bust. The only industries that can survive are creative industries. Um, so in that sense, to distinguish one from the other is, is, is mildly unhelpful. Um, we know what it is. Um, it's socially constructed, it's derivative, it needs to connect with a particular domain, uh, and we've got some sense of how these things come about, but um, we'll try and apply that a little bit. Uh, in terms of the history of creativity research, when you dig, perhaps where we are at the moment, I've mentioned De Bono already and a few others, um, the real boost and the reason why I've been so involved with the American Creativity Association uh, was the Russian launch of Sputnik in 1957. This caused the US at a national political level uh, to raise this discussion. We need to change what we're doing because we're losing. We're losing the race. So they did change what they were doing. And a number of other research areas have emerged. You may um, uh, recognise references to things like brainstorming or... Um, mind mapping, for example. All of these come out of uh, creativity research over the last few years. But we also know that undergraduates often have a vague notion of what it means in practice, um, particularly in non-creative subjects, um, education, strangely, being one of them. Um, the minority or a minority of academics think you can assess it reliably, so why bother going there if we can't assess it? How on earth are we supposed to measure it? Um, we tend to use it uncritically and slightly implicitly. We'll talk about it at great length. We had a uh, big marketing strategy within ADT two years ago, and the title of that marketing strategy, Arts, Design and Technology, Creating Creativity. And I asked very un uh, unwelcomed and probing questions. Do you know where we're creating creativity? Do you know how we're doing it? We might get asked. And I was told, we just mean, you know, students making things. Uh, look at all these paintings. Of course they're creating this stuff. They meant making stuff as opposed to being creative. Um, but it means different things in different contexts. And fundamental educational systems may kill creativity or, more worryingly, just making it clear that that's what we're trying to promote might kill it as well. The proverbial, just talk openly and freely. One, two, three, testing. Um, but we also know that if you pan out internationally, that actually, that's very interesting, um, that UK uh, graduates are supposedly more creative than international graduates. Um, you tend to be less constrained, or students graduating from UK higher in, uh, uh, education um, institutions tend to be less constrained in their thinking than graduates of non-UK universities or higher education systems. You tend to be able to think outside the box, have a little bit more um, uh, whimsy or humour or that ability to combine or extend in different ways uh, to spontaneously arrive at interesting new sporting titles and endeavours. Um, but we also know that graduates from the same area often have very underdeveloped creative capacities and abilities, and notably critical thinking. Now, I happen to think that a lot of that is a problem with um, early experience in, uh, in the workplace. So the first thing you're told is you're on a probationary year. So after this year, then you'll be on a full-time contract. So just don't make any mistakes this year. Um, most employers do say they don't like mistakes. And as we've already covered, making lots of mistakes is often one of the best ways to come up with really good new ideas. Um, but if anybody knows an employer who says, welcome, good to have you on board. I want you to cock things up as many times as you can over the next few weeks. Um, to see where, we, where that might lead. So let's just have a quick look through locating creativity. I've analysed all the quality assurance agency subject benchmark documents for the higher education sector in the UK. And running down from fifth place to first place, uh, art and design is the fifth most creative subject in terms of how often it refers to creativity and creative practice. <coughs> Communication, media, film and cultural studies is in at number four, with one references to create, create uh, 31 references to creative, although the tendency here tends to refer to analysing other people's creativity, has to be said, uh, but one reference to creation of content. 
Dance, drama and performance, as you might expect, at number three. Uh, history of art, architecture and design, but this is the archety archetypal example of where uh, people have, uh, well, the document refers to the detailed analysis and deconstruction of other historical creativity. And of course, number one, he says very smugly, being uh, music. Um, I did make a joke at the first creativity conference I went to that it was the only situation I think I've ever found myself in as a musician where I could legitimately say, trust me, I'm a musician. In nearly any other situation, that phrase doesn't tend to fit. Um, when they call for a doctor, they rarely want a musicologist, but every now and again they do. So music's very explicit. Uh, that's what we do. It's our nuts and bolts. Um, students have to be creative in interpreting repertoire, in terms of composing, developing new musical ideas, um, and in the study of their particular subject. And if you look at the concentration, you'll find that nearly all references to creativity in the QAA subject benchmark documents reside in the top ten. There's very few references outside of the top ten. Uh, and by the time you get outside of the top ten, you can see the curve a little bit more fully, you get down to the bottom end where people are not talking about this stuff at all. They're not saying anything to do with it. Um, so that concentration is quite an issue for me. So, two or fewer references to creativity in documents that are between 30 and 40,000 words long, which tells you something. Uh, economics is not a creative subject. There are two references to creation, and they both relate to the creation of national regulatory bodies, which isn't a very creative reference to creation. Um, we've got environmental science with one reference to creative. My view is that the earth sciences, or particularly environmental sciences, certainly need to be more creative than they are. That's the rhetoric you tend to pick up from the news. Um, but there are subjects without any reference to this stuff at all. Um, accounting is not a, a creative subject, but I'm sure most of you have heard of creative accounting before. Uh, but creative accounting is not creative accounting. Uh, it's fraud, and that's different. Um, but this is another topic, I suppose. Is all creativity good? No, it's not. Um, Organised crime are very creative. Uh, the mafiosi in, Nor uh, in Italy and Sicily are very creative organisations. Um, Adolf Hitler was very creative. Creativity is along a spectrum. Innovation in and of itself isn't necessarily always welcomed. I've just been very innovative in my science um, project. Oh, brilliant. Did you get a good mark? No. Uh, why? Because I killed everybody in the university. Um, I was aiming to produce the world's most toxic, fastest spreading serum, and I got a zero. Do you believe it? Um, so creativity needs to be context. It needs to be of benefit, uh, as well as original, and as well as recognisable. But there's no apparent creativity in finance, when you think that we need a lot more of that today. Um, there's no creativity in chemistry, but that for me is what chemistry means. That is chemistry. It is creation or creativity without wanting to get theological. Most um, troublingly, uh, there's no reference to creativity in education studies, the QAA benchmark documents. And I had an awkward moment with uh, my new line manager in LEI because I was chatting through some of this research and he looked at that slide and said, ooh, I ought to accept some responsibility for that because I was the uh, lead author on that document five years ago. Um, so just when you think you're talking in open and receptive terms, you realise you've put your foot in it, um, potentially. <clears throat> so creativity is uh, very unevenly distributed. It exists in different places. Um, we may be talking about trying to nurture uh, creativity rather than deliver it. Um, so I'm not entirely sure what this session is about, but I'm going to try and get to some... A specific conclusion shortly. And I've given a number of presentations to uh, staff and students about creativity. Sometimes, and I like to use the mining metaphor, uh, sometimes what you need to do is actually do something a lot more, not to try and be creative, but to be more gentle. And for me, the nearest equivalent there is this, this concept of panning for gold. Um, the calm, uh, sort of relaxed, um, focused, but disengaged, um, process of gradually panning for something, not expecting a huge nugget to suddenly appear, but this idea that if you do it for long enough, it will develop, it will accrue, it will build up, um, versus the other side, which is sometimes you just need to sweep in heavy machinery and just drill like mad to get this stuff. 
So sometimes we need to be hardcore, sometimes we need to be very relaxed and very gentle in our approach. Uh, and they'll produce different results in different ways. Um, this is a pernicious idea that I've mentioned before. On one level it's true. There is nothing I can say to you that will make your brain more creative. On the other hand, there are things that I could suggest that if you decide are worth adopting or reflecting, uh, would hopefully lead you down a path toward producing better ideas. Um, but we know the latter part of that sentence is true. And the best way of killing creativity in higher education, he says with great irony, it's the ubiquity of the lecture, of asking people to sit passively and to do all their learning still and quiet in their brain while somebody at the front talks to them, passes over information and knowledge which goes in and immediately re rewires the neurology of your brain. So apologies for today, um, but there's not much we can do, I'm afraid, with where we are. But we do need to rethink what we mean by pedagogy. Um, the term itself comes from, or the original, one of the Latin derivations, is to lead a child, uh, and that won't do. If we're going to have a different approach to learning and teaching or to the educational process in higher education that will produce more creative results, we need to work together more. Um, so we need to challenge some of those, or where that box is for education, and we need to step out of it as well, um, which I think is a, a very significant point. Now, I'm going to try and um, drift through this towards some specific creative thinking techniques. In the end, this is what Edward de Bono mentioned earlier on, lateral uh, and vertical thinking. The problem with education is it tends to be focused on vertical thinking. Conventions. This is where your, uh, excuse me, where your subject sits in. This is how things are done. This is how that works. This is how you use that camera. Um, here's that, uh, the history of this particular convention. You try and reproduce it. And then we hope that innovation comes out of mastering already mastered techniques. Uh, whereas lateral thinking, which involves deliberately thinking against the grain or being entirely ignorant of way, the way things have worked up until that point, and Edward de Bono's contribution was to think of lateral thinking techniques. I'll resist giving you an example here, but I will do uh, in, a, in a short while. This idea, and he uses a, a sort of a road as a metaphor, that you can think we're driving in that direction, and we know our destination is that way, so we'll stay on this road. And this little side turn down here, that's aiming in the wrong direction, so we'll ignore it. But you and I know, if you've ever been to a strange city, that this road that's going in that direction to go there suddenly starts to curve round, and then you see a sign saying the next available turn-off is nine miles away, and you realise, no, I'm going in the opposite direction now. And sometimes those little side turns are shortcuts to a destination you were trying to get to to start with. But how you provoke your brain, break or stop your brain coming up with the usual predicted patterns, if you're going over there, I'd drive in that direction, seems obvious to me, off we go. To thinking, well, if we went back in the opposite direction, we might get over there more quickly. And sometimes that will work. Uh, oh, I've got a couple of examples. I'll give you a couple of examples. I applied um, a lateral thinking model to trying to counsel some second year students a couple of years ago. Um, you're all getting ready for your independent studies in your final year, yes, and so we need some ideas. Nobody had any ideas. We need some ideas for a research project. That's a bit brighter again. So the first student comment we had in opposition was, well, it's all very well talking about a dissertation, but I just can't see how I'm going to write 10,000 words. The provocation, don't type any words. And then a student solved that provocation. Yeah, just use dictation software. So we closed the loop. You all have to type 10,000 words next year. I don't want to type any, in which case don't. Find a different way of ending, the, ending up with those on paper. And, and there are other examples there as well. In other words, in almost any situation where a student tried to take the conversation away from research projects and dissertations to something else that related to them, we got back to a viable research project via that provocation. And I'll give you a better example perhaps in a short while. The bottom line is, um, just to wrap up this idea of the problem with education, we give you plenty of signals about what the wrong thing to do will be. Uh, but we often don't give you very strong um, signals about what the right thing to do will be, to be creative, because we don't know. 
Uh, we'd like you all to be innovative. We're expecting you to come up with the following types of innovative ideas. You can't do it. There's a famous cartoon uh, of somebody who goes to a patent office and the patent clerk says, look, I'm sorry, I can't give you a list of all of the patent applications that haven't been filed yet. I can't tell you what innovations haven't been copyrighted as yet because we don't know when they'll come or what they'll be. So you need to be mindful about risk um, and there are ways of mitigating risk and we have a responsibility I think in HE to write in an obligation for you to get risk. I'm going to mine a mod one of my modules for next year to say students are to demonstrate the capacity to take risks and to embrace failure and to learn something from the process. In which case I'll be able to go in front of students and say we all want you to take risks and to fail. Because if you don't, you'll fail. Or pass. No, I've got that wrong. I need to think that through a bit more. But if we are going to learn more from failure, the idea that you can try something, get it wrong, try something again, get it even more wrong, and then somebody think, what are you trying to make there? Well, I was trying to make X. But it looks like fantastic Y or something else. Have you thought about doing this with it or that with it? Um, some more stories on that front to wrap up in a moment. So creativity, innovation, ownership, we talk about, all, talk about all three in education. Um, you go over to business studies, they talk about little else other than entrepreneurship. That's their bread and butter. Ask them where the ideas come from and they'll say, well, anywhere we can find them, we don't care. Um, we'll sell anything. We're not going to come up with the thing we're going to sell. We're going to be very creative in our approach to selling it. You guys are perhaps more, it's expected that you'll be more creative. Um, but it's undeniably the case that you're also going to have to be more entrepreneurial. And it might be just finding the right entrepreneur. That may be the only skill you need to develop. Find an entrepreneur who's clueless about new ideas, but very, very clued up in terms of business opportunities, and you might have the connections that you need. But we're not quite sure how they interrelate. And I think they interrelate very differently according to subject. So for some subjects in ADT, I think that all three of those things overlap. They may be considered the same thing. Across the university, they may be very different things. It's not necessarily the case that most lab-based scientists are principally involved in finding commercial applications for their science. Other people tend to do that. Um, the development of graphene at, at Manchester University is a very good example. Where we've made this stuff and it's got all these properties. Who knows? And various other people have come in and say, well, if it's got those properties, it could be used for this, that, or the other. And, and then eventually the circle is squared, if that makes sense. Um, I'm going to move on from that. And we're going to move on from that as well. So last but not least, uh, if we've got time for this last test, we might have to work past the last exercise, but I'll um, talk to you finally about creative thinking techniques. Uh, ideation is not just a vague term that Disney apply to what their organisation does. It's a specific programme. Um, a colleague of mine that works at Orlando in Disney, the um, education and student placements officer, I had a chat with her in Florida a couple of years ago, and she said, oh, we're only a small university. We've got three cohorts of about 45,000 students per year. So that's, that's a big university. Oh, is it? Most of our universities are a lot, lot larger than that. But they learn this stuff. Um, very quick insight. How many people here have seen The Incredibles? Cartoon film, quite a few, so you'll know what I'm talking about. It very nearly didn't get made, um, primarily because the screen play had lots of references to open water, the sea. Now, I don't know if, how many people here know much about programming or, or rendering digital video or animation, but digitising or making digital seascapes is very expensive. You can imagine all the subtleties, just like grass or human hair, it's, it's really complicated. But somebody did the classic um, uh, problem reversal. Let's not animate any of the sea. And then somebody else chipped in. Let's film the sea and then make it look animated. And then they found the solution. So if you look at that film again and get to see it, bear in mind that all the animated sea is not animated sea. It's filmed sea that's been processed to look a bit animated and they saved tens of millions of pounds worth of, or dollars worth of programming time. Um, there are plenty of others as well. I'll come back to one or two of the others, but combining uh, unusual ideas, introducing random ideas, uh, I suppose the one I did want to mention, um, lateral thinking, uh, introducing a provocation. Um, there was a restaurant in the Midwest in the US, uh, middle of nowhere, its sales month on month were declining every week. 
So they brought in a creativity consultant who sat down and said, we're going to use De Bono's techniques. We're going to think of a provocation. What does your restaurant comprise of? Uh, a restaurant, uh, a reception, there's toilets, a car park, and a kitchen. Right, get rid of one of them. Uh, well, we can't get rid of one of them. No, this is just get rid of one. Pick one to get rid of. Well, we can't get rid of... We'll get rid of the toilets. Uh, we'll get rid of the toilets. Right. So you've got rid of the toilets. You've now got new space. What are you going to put back in place of the toilets? And then suddenly somebody lit up. An art gallery. So now that restaurant is the most visited restaurant in the state because they got in touch with the local art gallery and they put a rolling, weekly changing art exhibit into the ladies' and gents' toilets. And people drive from miles around because they can get a good meal and they can go and look at an art exhibit in the toilets when they go for a break. And it's the only restaurant in America, apparently, I think it's been copied since. So take what you think is possible, reverse it, realise you end up in something that's impossible, and then just find a way of solving that. Well, yeah, we could put the toilets back. Yeah, I suppose that'd be OK. Um, other, other ideas. Another Edward de Bono context. Uh, six thinking hats. These are the six different ways uh, that you will likely think about uh, work that you're doing, ideas that you have, tasks that you face, problems to overcome. And the reality is that we tend to wear all of these hats at once. We panic and we see opportunities. Simply speaking, just be strategic. Get a good map or layout of the six thinking hats and deliberately sit down and wear one in turn. Right, I'm going to think optimistically about this and ruthlessly think only in optimistic terms. And if you work through any problem by thinking strategically in each of these ways, you'll end up with a balanced result. Best example, um, there was an IT conflict in a major organisation, wasn't here, but I won't say where it was, where the senior management were trying to introduce a new IT system. All of the staff were in opposition to it, the IT people involved in integrating it, and this staff were at loggerheads. So a meeting was brought together, and the facilitator said to the IT team, you're not to say anything at all during the first part of the meeting. You're not to chip in, you're not to respond, you're to keep quiet. So they went to the representative of the staff team and said, I gather you've got some concerns about this IT system, and there was, oh, yes, it won't work, it's terrible, we're overworked, it's awful. And the IT team who were there to defend themselves had to bite their lip, but they kept quiet. After a while, the facilitator kept asking the questions of this team, what the problems were, what that might mean. And then one of the people who'd come in with a problem eventually put his hand up and said, I suppose you could get round this one problem in the following way. And before you knew it, the team who'd come in to oppose this problem had solved all the problems. Because they were confronted with this, well, if we had to do it, what would you do? Or what do you think about this problem? Could you solve it? What would you do differently? And this IT team who'd come in for a bun fight with their colleagues suddenly found their colleagues in opposition writing all the solutions to this problem on how to implement it onto the whiteboard because they'd been told to think in this way. All right, put the green positivity hat on, the creativity hat on. How would you get beyond this problem? And they managed to produce the result. Unusual combinations, one of my favourites. Oh, it's not as clear. That's a dog bird. If you do a search on Google Images for dog bird, you'll find loads and loads and loads of these. They're really weird. Um, but somebody at some point thought, I know, I'll Photoshop a dog's head onto a bird. Why? Why not? Uh, and hundreds have since, and they're quite unusual. Deliberate combinations of unusual ideas. If you've got something to solve as a problem, just get anything else as weirdly unconnected as possible and attach it. And then take a step back and think, now what could I make of that? What would be useful about that? Or how can I resolve that or make sense of it? Um, this is where I was going to do the challenge, but we're going to run out of time. Um, but you can play this game yourselves. I play it an awful lot. The acronym challenge. We all live through acronyms at the University of Derby. Pick your favourite acronym and compete with your colleagues in acronym battles to produce the most ridiculous full-length version of that acronym. I've given you some examples. For me, EEC is much more imaginative as the English Enterprise Clowns or Executive Egg Committee. Um, but play with them. Take an acronym. And again, practice this idea of fluency by coming up as many different versions as you can. You'll be surprised. At least one may throw up something to you that, you, that will lead you somewhere else in terms of interesting ideas. But we'll leave that for the time being.
Last but not least, problem reversal, which is often the most successful. Um, I'm sure many people here will use the multiple blade razors for shaving various parts of their anatomy. Um, a story about how we got to there. Uh, in the 1980s, um, various disposable razor companies were facing the same problem. Um, lots more competitors in the market, and the feedback from customers was always the same, consumer groups. The blades aren't sharp enough, they go blunt too quickly, they don't, cut, they don't shave closely enough. So they put a number of teams together uh, to try and solve that problem. Blades aren't sharp enough, therefore the solution is what? If a shaving blade isn't sharp enough, what do you do? Make it sharper. Do you know what the actual solution is? Make it blunter. So if anybody doesn't know how these multiple blade shavers work, the first blade at the top pulls the hair out so that the lower blades can cut it further down. So in order to make these multiple blade razors work better than the single blade razors, the first of those blades needs to be blunter so that it will grab hold of the hair and pull it but not cut it. It pulls it out and then the lower blades cut it further down. So the answer to getting a closer shave was not to make the blade sharper. It was to use more blades but to make at least one of them blunter than they've ever been. Um, and you'll see this time and time and time again, that the solution to the problem is often the reverse of what you expect. Um, and again, there were lots of companies that spent millions in market research because they think, right, blades need to be sharper, so therefore this group needs to work out how to make sharper blades, off you go. And before they'd even started, they were not likely to get to the solution. And it took thinking outside the box or reversing the problem uh, before they got to a significant conclusion. Um, so, um, spontaneity does matter. Uh, if you too are going to create a new combination sport uh, that might take off in the same way as my daughter's new Olympic sport, um, you need to be open to these possibilities. Your brain is doing this the whole time, uh, throwing up ideas and making unusual connections between things. So spontaneity does matter. There is a reason why we tend to feel like we have good ideas in the shower whilst we're in between things, wandering, daydreaming, dawdling, doodling. Uh, it's because our brain is more open, because we're concentrating less. But you need to find ways of trapping those, of keeping a dream diary, or of recognising that some of your best ideas may emerge as soon as you awake. Um, and then the longer you leave it, you might miss them. Um, you can become more creative by uh, trying to do new things, by inaugurating new patterns, changing your perspective. If you repeat the same activities every day, day in, day out, and do them in the same way, you're channeling down. You may be refining your professionalism, but you may be undermining what you might be able to do uh, in other respects. Um, so very little time for Q&A, but a little bit of time. And we were going to title this session from making it to making it. Um, We've still got plenty of time, good. Um, so we can go back through things if I've scooted over things. But um, if you're going to be employing yourself, if you're going to be um, carving out a career in a future that nobody can tell you what it's going to be like, creativity is und uh, uh, undoubtedly going to matter. Um, but as well as me t talking to you about some of the work that I've done, I would very much appreciate not just questions necessarily, but insights as well about what you understand creativity to be, where it is, how it emerges, or with reference to your own discipline, how do you think you get there, if that makes sense. So, yes, anybody got any questions or queries this morning? I'm going to have a closer look at these whilst we stay in object science. Take a risk, ask a question. It's no such thing as a bad question. I must have given a full and detailed account of everything. Uh, all right. How many people think somebody else has got a question they'd like to ask? All right. Would somebody like to ask a question on behalf of somebody else, if you haven't got a question yourself? Would you like me to ask a question on your behalf? Your time you're wasting. One at a time. Go on. Come on. Somebody must have a question. What, what is creativity in your subject? How do you recognise it? Do you think you all agree on the same thing? Do you think you could put a series of examples on the wall and you would all know what was more, most creative or least creative? How would we know that? Have you got a cattle prod? Well, the problem with our creativity, I find, is that 
we're all using we're all obviously using the same equipment, but we are copying what is around us. Right. So we're not so you're saying creativity, take ideas and put them together and not being different to be different, you know, like sort of original I'm saying other words except okay. but like that sort of so if you are patterning and modelling your uh, 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 photography on, on, on exact established practice, that's, that's a, a vertical thinking approach, which is necessary. Uh, we can't just have um, original photographers who've got no idea what's required or done professionally, but you, need, you perhaps need to offset that. I know very little about photography, um, and I can't remember where I saw it. I think it was a BBC TV advert. Wildlife photography. Close-up shots. Tigers, dangerous. So the solution is what? Be far away. The best way to safely take close-up shots is to take distant shots and then to crop the image. <laughs> the safest and sensible thing to do is not to try and creep close as you can to a tiger so that it's there. That would not be the right solution. So it's another example of problem reversal. Um, but suggestions, what do we do? If you're learning convention and technique, how on earth can you take an original photograph? Very good. Model the convention, do what it is you've been asked to do in terms of modelling it, and then think, what would the reverse be? Is there a reverse? Um, but try and do it backwards or upside down. Uh, one thing I may come back to talk to you about is some work I've been doing on synesthesia and other things. And we had the thought, because part of what we were doing was taking photographs and digital material from different parts of this building and trying to work with it more um, holistically, all together, so not being visual or sound or other things, but all, all at once. Um, and we wanted to take a photograph um, of certain parts of the building, but we thought, well, we want to use sound as well. So we took photographs without using a camera. How did we do that? Uh, we took sonograms of particular spaces. We took impulse responses, which when you reproduce them, you can produce as an image, but are actually recordings of a sound in a given space. But because the sound bounces off all the surfaces, you can still recognise the shape and size of it. So how can you take an original photograph? Don't use a camera. That might only take you so far, but you take the point. Take the thing out that you think is critical and see what's left and then think, well, how am I going to solve that as a problem? Probably. Anybody else? I'm sorry, I think I've destroyed their enthusiasm for their subject. I, I did try my best. Thank you very much for your Torrance examples. Um, explore that, and if you do a dig round online, you can find where other people have done similar tests. And actually, you can start to work out how creativity is measured. Because if we had time, what we do here is just um, remove all of those uh, ideas that are common to lots of you until we end up with two or three that will be common just to one person. And if they really work and they're quite engaging and original, that's a very creative act. And some people here may have just come up with those ideas seemingly from nowhere. Um, just occurred to me, just done it. Um, but that's your brain finding a solution. Um, but try and be more fluent, do more stuff, um, and read about it. And if you're going to pick up any book, uh, I've brought several. Um, Michael Michalko is on LinkedIn. Uh, this book is in the library, several are in the library, and Thinker Toys is extremely accessible. And all it is is a series of different ways of practicing different creative thinking techniques. Uh, you could go to Edward de, de Bono by all means, but it's uh, a bit weightier, a bit more psychological. Uh, and not quite as ready in terms of his solutions. But those things work as well. Um, but thank you very much indeed for the time being. Thank you. Thank you. Can we just um, try to do it again, or Chris just try to do it again? <laughs> to have some form of communication about how you're going to respond to this? Or what, what actually opens near, what you're always talking about? Uh, mm.
choose policies to develop further. Mm. And the reason for that, I think, has been up there. And actually, these two or three ideas should come out of 10 or 20 ideas. Mm. Not precious ideas. ideas. Yeah? Um, so these kind of things are really, really important to, to kind of reflect and, and maybe do exercises on. Well. Yeah? Maybe you take the idea of the project you're doing in the other module, or the two or three, and maybe you turn it into 20 or 30 ideas that are slightly different. And just churn them out. Yeah? Um, and come away from this preciousness because I think that's where I can see more students in our discipline. But it's nice to you late, I think, because you get something from music. Hmm. I think it's the same thing about wanting to be original, about wanting to do something that's fantastic, you know, and, and almost it's counterproductive because you limit your initial creativity to get to a good solution. And I think that's quite important to understand. It's almost uh, trying to play at the beginning that's important without any value to it. It's not good or bad, it just comes out and you can do something with it. There's a very, um, I haven't got a whiteboard marker with me. I can sort of describe it visually. In any project, um, there is a point that you need to reach that, that's finished and sorted out. We know that exists. We know that there's a starting point, uh, but the best way of describing uh, effectively, the, 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 uh, an opening out to explore as many ideas as is possible, you can only do that for so far. You can't still be opening out the day before the assessment's due. But neither should you, and I hear this an awful lot, know exactly where you're aiming to get to the day that the assignment is set. One of the principal um, characteristics of, of creative endeavour is this willingness to be in an uncomfortable position of not quite knowing, of uncertainty. But not all the way up until the deadline. So, at certain, so initially, I'm trying to think which way you can do it, that there'll be an opening out, an exploration. How far do the possibilities of this task go? What options are there? What information can I gather together? And then at a certain point, there needs to be a, a convergence again, aiming towards that submission deadline or a week before. Uh, but where you have the opportunity to spiral your thoughts out of control, to end up somewhere entirely inappropriate with time to come back again, then that's at the beginning. Cover the ground. Make all your mistakes now, not two or three, three days before you come back. And, and try these techniques. Make it crazy, make it huge, take lots of ideas together, and then perhaps take two or three of them together and try and stick them together. Um, we're going to make massive photographs, but we're not going to use a camera. How on earth can we make sense of that statement or whatever it might be? And, and some of them won't work. Um, there was a very interesting uh, uh, conversation with uh, Sir Clive Sinclair. The British inventor invented the Sinclair C5, the doomed electric vehicle, uh, much laughed at. He was asked about this and said, do you still do you re regret the C5? No. What, what do you mean? Well, it, it didn't work. Most of the things I do don't work. What's your point? Well, d didn't it affect you in any way? No. I was busy the day after it all collapsed. I was doing something else. So this idea that what we do is do something, make a mistake at it, and then live with that mistake, you can see why we don't want to repeat that experience. Whereas if we just reveled in it and thought, yeah, I've cocked that up, that was terrible, what a mistake. Brilliant, now where next? Or sometimes, this idea I've made... Terrible, it's not suitable at all. No, 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 keep going. Make it more ridiculous. Take it a further step of ridiculous on. Chat to your friends and say, what's the most ridiculous idea you've got? Let's put your most ridiculous idea with my most ridiculous idea and, and see where we get to. Um, can you imagine, um, sorry, I'll shut up in a moment, uh, what the meeting with Steve Jobs could be like? Steve, got an idea. What's that? You know this music industry? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do people do? Well, they... they collect records and CDs. Yeah. What do they do? Well, they, they, they collect those and they treat them and they organise them and then they go to gigs and that kind of thing. So what do they love about the music industry? Well, they like the CDs and, and that some people like the smell of them. They like buying them and looking for them. I've got a great idea. We can get rid of all of that. What? Well, instead of having CDs, the thing that, that the whole industry operates on, we'll just sell them a little device and then they can download it from the internet. Is the internet capable of that? No, not now. Um, 
you, you take the point. If you do what, it was, it was Henry Ford who said, if I only gave consumers what they were asking for, I would have just made faster horses. Um, you, you give them what they're not expecting yet. You can, you can redefine industries or redefine things that you're doing if you just have that courage to think what if and what's around the corner. But there are, there are loads of examples of that. Any more questions? Please. I, I, right, I should, I should um, a disclaimer. By all means, I don't mean repeat. Uh, we call, of course we want you to repeat successes and, and exceed your successes, but try to at least be mindful of the fact that your brain will, will force you to think that the right way of repeating that success is through repeating the same patterns of behaviour. Um, and I don't mean do things entirely differently, but be mindful of the fact that you will repeat how you achieved your last success as well as your last success. And if the answer to um, uh, um, writing an essay is to repeat directly how you wrote the last essay, you'll end up with the same essay, in which case you'll be guilty of plagiarism and you'll be, you, you take the point. You're going to have to at least inaugurate some new patterns to maintain that momentum. Um, so be mindful of the way your brain will work like that. It does it on every level. Oh, I've got to get dressed up smart tomorrow. What shall I do? Well, I'll put my suit on, obviously. How imaginative. Um, it's easier for men than it is for women, but it, 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 we do it all the time. Um, and it's particularly evident, uh, particularly in lower stages of primary education, where teachers are, are warned to be mindful of this. Don't let the student ask to repeat the same thing, because they'll just make the same picture again and say, do I still get an A? No. Um, if that, does that make sense? Yeah. Does everybody think that you have to repeat what you did last time? Well, it's all over on those lines. Not really. I haven't done that, because I want to. No, I'm not, not, I'm not, you know, I'm, yeah. not, I'm not kind of picking at you, but you brought it up. Um, you're not to repeat what you did last year. You, you kind of to develop it. I, I thought that was quite clear. Obviously, you need to consider, but that's a good point because actually, you are concerned of what you're interested in and what you want to work on. And of course, it's good to reflect on what worked, and that's what you will do. And obviously, within that process, you will ask yourself why that worked, maybe. Yeah? But this, this other module that you refer to is explicitly there for you to then develop it further in light of other models. You know? So it actually expects you to almost develop different patterns with the same subject matter, you know, with your initial interests. Mm. So explicitly, <laughs> not repeating last year, but you know, picking up what worked for you, uh, both in terms of subject and I think in terms of process and developing, it's important to reflect on that and what you could do different and what knowledge you gain right now by looking at external things and looking at other things um, in terms of what you can then change about your process. Yeah. Standard case where you could use provocation techniques. Um, and again, they can be as abstract as you like. It can be um, the problem is, is, is um, economically providing accessible pharmacies for dispensing um, uh, um, drugs and medication for a particular community. We can't solve this problem. The provocation is a seaside holiday. And you, you, get, you start to realise what, what de Bono means by provocation. It, it's a way of forcing the brain to tap into other connections that it otherwise might not. Um, because we'll tend to think, ah, right, staffing, wage costs, opening hours, and we're getting more and more and more vertical in our thinking, and the solution might be somewhere else. Um, and I've just thought of one. You know, on the beach in uh, Europe, you have people wandering around with little trays selling nuts and cold drinks. Don't sell the, uh, or don't dispense your uh, uh, um, uh, pharmaceuticals from a chemist. Have people go out and deliver them, for example, in which case you could solve the problem. So it, it, it just depends on the context, but there, there are ways of, of, of tapping into other ways of thinking that you have that you won't routinely use. Uh, Humour is very important for this. He says, looking at some very bored faces. But um, 
That's what humour does. That's why we like humour, because it surprises our brains by saying, no, the connection was over there instead. Um, and, and that lights us up. So we love it when it happens. There you go. Anybody else got any questions or queries? Go on. It's annoying. Um, the, you say you've got to open up. This, this is annoying me. OK. And then you have to pinpoint. Yeah. Can I just keep going? Do I, why do I have to end? Um, well, this is, this is the curse of assessment, partly, um, but to a certain extent it's the curse of everything. Uh, if you're going to be creative, being on the way to producing a fantastic outcome at the point at which somebody's there to see it won't, won't, won't be good enough. Um, to a certain extent, you know, with references to Tim Berners-Lee and others, there are some scientists who are, uh, or uh, great writers, or, or painters, or composers, who earn the right to sort of muse over things for long periods and then produce a, a great result at the end. Um, but you, you, the idea that creativity is just something we can't predict, we can't timescale for, we can't steer in any way that we're just subject to and we can't control is one of the more dangerous ideas. Um, in reality, you can strategically decide, I'm going to explore this as widely as I possibly can now, see as far away as I can get, and then I'm going to start coming back down. And now in reality, it might be a series of open and close. Um, but you need to know, if you're going to be good at project managing, um, that you're going to be able to reach a deadline with the right conclusions or with the right material, with the right form of stuff that will be needed. And without that ability to organise for that, compromising your ability to be creative. It's the other myth. <coughs> I'm very creative. I'm no good at organising doesn't make sense to me. Um, you can be both. And if you are very good at organising, sometimes there is such a thing as creative organisation, um, which is another field entirely, logistics. Anybody else? Great. Well, shall I press stop for the time being? Um, And if anybody would like to chat about anything in particular, do come give me a, a shout. <laughs>